Hello and welcome. We're glad that you have decided to join us by listening to our featured Sermon of the Week. This week's message is presented by Pastor Henry Wright and entitled, I Do Not Apologize. We hope that you enjoy this message and that God uses it to bless, encourage, and teach you while you listen. Well, I tell you, the Lord is so good, isn't he? Kind of gives you what you need when you need it. Let's go back to Isaiah 46. <coughs> and you got to pray for me today. I'm sure the Lord will get me through some kind of way. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. This is one of my, and by the way, sound team, the sound on me is excellent. Excellent. This is perfect. The sound is perfect, Kevin. Draw lines, put marks. <laughs> Don't mess with this. <laughs> Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. What, what, what has always moved me, Carlson, about this text is that it's like God has kind of tiptoed all through the Bible. And finally he just gets tired. And he says, just in case you've been reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, works your way through Joshua, Judges, the Kings, Samuel, and the Chronicles, stumbled through Proverbs, Job, Esther, Nehemiah, and Ecclesiastes, and you missed it. Before you get to Revelation, let me make it clear. I'm the only one. Come on, saints. I am the only God. I do not have a twin. There's none like me. And then to define what his godliness is, how it manifests itself. He says, the thing I do that nobody else can do is, I say on Monday, 2005, what will take place on Saturday, 3000. And I do not have to worry about any correction, because if I declare it, it shall come to pass. It is God's boasting text. Today, I want to continue on a road that I have been on for the past couple of sermons. Now, it's a part of the mission series. We've been talking about mission, maintaining focus on mission how mission gives you purpose, how mission guarantees trial and tribulation. Thank you. How mission gives you responsibility and legacy and accountability. How mission gives us a certain alertness and sensitivity to the times. And today's sermon reflects that sensitivity to the times that we should have. How mission must include the Lord demolishing us in order to renovate us, as he did with John Mark, to make us profitable to him. And then even in my special sermon to the singles the other week, I talked about how that period of life is a time for special 
focus on God so that as we form later companionships, we already have a clear head on who we are in Jesus. And then talking about Caleb, we, we, we talked about how, how, how mission really drives us to be dreamers and attainers as long as we're alive. The old man said, give me this mountain. But in this year, recent current events have restirred the urgency with which we should look at the signs of the times. The fulfillment of prophecy. It, it, it is through fulfilling and fulfillment of and constant fulfilling of prophecy that, that, that God is constantly dragging the church, sometimes kicking and screaming, to their destiny to meet him. In two communion sermons, I, I honed in on the events surrounding the death of Pope John Paul II. We looked at the amazing system of communication that now made it possible for an entire planet to mourn over the death of one man. It was an awesome thing to witness. This little Polish-born priest received the adoration and tears of one billion Catholics, as well as the greatest leaders of society. The, 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 the whole world literally wondered after and I pointed out that it's important for people of the book, important for people of the book to look carefully and, and think reflectively because these events stirred up interest in and conversations about many teachings. For instance, the teaching of the state of the dead. And I shared with you the fact that, that, that one of the great bishops of the church uh, during the during the casting, the video casting of John Paul's death, made the statement that 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 it suddenly occurred to him that he no longer uh, had to pray for the Pope; he could now pray to the Pope. And some of you know that in the past two weeks, Larry King Live has spent a whole week with so-called experts discussing what happens after people die. The thing that left me frustrated and amazed at these discussions, Joy, is that I never heard anybody quote a Bible text. But they did philosophy ad nauseum. For several, several minutes. In my second sermon on Communion Sabbath, under the title, The Death of a King, I explained that the Catholic Pope carries the title Vicar of Christ, which means that he is the representative of the life and ministry of Christ on earth. But I also reminded us of the fact that, 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 that the person who sits as Pope is also a king. The Vatican is a separate independent kingdom, so I dealt with the pomp and circumstance, the obvious opulence that attended the burial of Pope John Paul. In contrast, I dealt with it in contrast to the simplicity and lack of attention given to the tragic death and burial of Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The funeral of Christ was cru the, the, fu the funeral of Christ, who was crucified by the Romans as the King of the Jews was attended by two men, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and a handful of sorrow-filled women. But the funeral of John Paul II was attended by 35 presidents, 16 prime ministers, 16 kings and queens, and 150 world leaders, and watched by almost 2 billion of the world's 5 billion people. And I made the point that all this was made possible because from the time that John Paul was, 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 was made Pope in 1978, this great 
technological explosion has ad, 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 has made it possible now for something that we Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching for over a hundred years. Has made it possible now for, for one group, one person, to influence the thought of an entire planet. Just by appearing in front of a camera. And so things we've been preaching for years, and folk have been kind of looking at Adventists a little cockeyed, they're now saying, just a minute. It is possible for the whole world to wander after somebody. Today, I'm going to journey further. Now, I don't feel all that great, so I'm going to take my time. you got things to do, slip out. Now, the attention that John Paul is getting, I say again, has, has caused certain teachings and, and doctrines to be raised to the fore. The state of the dead, for instance. Uh, the belief in prayers to the saints. Uh, indulgences, the whole thing. It's, just, it's all being so publicized. <coughs> During his papacy, setting you up now for where I'm going today, John Paul made four startling apologies. These amazing admissions or apologies causes me to explore today one of the prime teachings concerning the papacy. But before I identify the teaching, let me explore the apologies. And by the way, my sermon today is entitled, I Don't Apologize. The first thing that the pontiff apologized for was not doing more to aid the Jews during the Holocaust. He apologized for that. He apologized, number two, for blaming the Jews for crucifying Jesus. He apologized for the church. He apologized, number three, for carrying out the crusade against the Muslims. And he apologized, number four, for persecuting other Christians who were non-Catholics, something, by the way, that the church has refused to admit to for a thousand years. Now, each of these on its own, if really thought through, is enough for a sermon. For instance, number two, and the purpose of the sermon today is not to review the apologies. It's to review the circumstances that make the apologies, the apologies a paradox. But, but if you just take number two, for instance, no longer blaming the Jews for the crucifixion of Christ, can the Pope undo what the Bible makes clear? Now, I'm not an anti-Semite. But if you read John 19, 4 and 5, Pilate, the Roman, was prepared to free Jesus. There's no question about that. I find no fault in this man. Matthew 27, Mark 13, Luke 23, all reveal that when Pilate sought to release a prisoner to the Jews, according to the Passover tradition, the Jewish leadership chose the criminal Barabbas for freedom rather than Christ. John 19:12 reveals that the Jews insisted on the crucifixion of Jesus against the desire of Pilate, and then their crime was sealed with this statement in Matthew, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now I say again, I have nothing personal against Jewish people individually or collectively, but the Bishop of Rome cannot absolve what Holy Scriptures clearly teach as an historical fact. But that's what happens Watch me now. When a person 
presumes to rise to a level that may not be theirs to attain. So what is it about the papacy that causes them to feel that they can make statements on the part of all the rest of us? It is simply this. My subject, I do not apologize. One of the most controversial teachings of the Catholic Church is the teaching that the Pope is infallible. Infallible. Now, let me state up front, this teaching is not even universally accepted by all Catholics, or understood, or taught, especially by some of its scholars. But the teaching was first decreed in the Vatican Council of 1870, Pope Leo XIII was in charge, one of the great popes in the hierarchy of the church. And this is a summary of the teaching. Ready, Dion? Here's the teaching. Therefore, faithfully adhering to the tradition received from the beginning of the Christian faith, we teach and define that it is a dogma divinely revealed. that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians, by virtue of the supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine regarding faith or morals to be held by the universal church, by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, is possessed of that infallibility, which, which the divine redeemer will well, willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrine regarding faith or morals, and that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable of themselves, and nor and not from the consent that should be not rather than nor, and that's my mistake, Dion, and not from the consent of the church. When he speaks ex cathedra as the pastor of the church. What he says is irreformable, infallible, and doesn't even need the consent of the rest of the Catholics. Now, the points to remember are these. One, the Catholic Church claims this to be a revealed doctrine. It came from heaven. Two, the pontiff has infallibility only when he speaks on doctrine as the pastor of the church, not in general conversation. Three, these doctrinal statements by the Pope are irreformable, can't be corrected. Four, such statements do not require the consent of the church. Now, it should be observed at this point. That infallibility for the Pope was not a teaching until after 1870. In fact, in the catechism before that, they accused the Protestants of calling the Pope infallible, but said they did not. So the Pope's right to speak on behalf of the Church is the belief and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church since 1870. The Pope's right to speak on behalf of all Christians, even who are not Catholic, Though a presumption is also a belief and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, therefore in the minds of Catholic leadership, John, Paul, or any pontiff can ap apologize for all of us. Now, is he infallible? You see, I'm having trouble with the word infallible and apology. <laughs> See, my subject is I do not apologize. There's somebody who does not apologize. We're getting there. But 
There's something wrong with this picture. Infallible? Apologize. Come on, come, come, come. Now, there's some problems raised by the teaching of infallibility on the part of the Pope. Did the infallibility, did the infallibility voted into doctrine in 1870 reach back and make all the doctrinal proclamations by all the popes before 1870 correct and infallible? Two, wasn't it a part of Catholic teaching that the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ? It was, by the way. And if that was announced by an infallible person, then how can another infallible person make what another infallible person said infallible? <laughs> Is anybody listening to me? And wasn't the persecution of the other Christians done by the decree and blessing of previous popes before 1870, namely by the Inquisition? And were not the Crusades also encouraged, blessed and enjoined by Pontus? If they were made infallible by the decrees of 1870, then they did nothing wrong. Therefore, why apologize? Let me read you a statement from a Catholic, Philip Schaff, the writer of Christendom, Creeds of Christendom. He observes, he does, by the way, this Catholic does not believe in the, the infallibility of the Pope. He, he observes that if, that if infallibility for a Pope only, listen now, this is a thinker, if infallibility for a Pope only applies when they speak as Pope, then that same person who is Pope could have private opinions contrary to the church's teaching. Therefore, he can be both pope and heretic at the same time. Now, part three of the sermon. Let's look at our words. Dion, give them the definition of the word infallible. Read this with me. Incapable. No, 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 Incapable of error. Keep reading. Never. Keep reading. Not liable to fall, go wrong, or make. Let's put the next word up. Apologize. Read. To make an apology. Do you see the problem I have today? By the way, it would be appropriate if we also put up there the formal definition for the word apology, a formal written or spoken defense of some idea, relig religion, philosophy, and so on, an acknowledgment of some fault. Now, why is this important? See, you can't have it both ways. Even in declaring doctrine, is it wise for any human to claim that they have the incapacity to err? See, this is the description of man in the Bible. Genesis 6, 5. His thoughts are evil continually. Yes. 
First Kings 846. There is none that sinneth not. Psalm 53, 3. None doeth good, no, not one. Isaiah 53, 6. All we have gone astray, 64, 6. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you finding any room for infallibility in those texts? In any human being? And then first John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Let me paraphrase that. If we say we've made a mistake, if we say we can't make a mistake, rather, we deceive ourselves. So in the Bible context, infallibility is not the territory for mankind. Stay with me now. You cannot put infallibility and a human being in the same sentence. Woe to the man or woman that dares approach the realm of infallibility in any area of their existence because, because this is an area reserved for one, one entity in the universe. The Bible predicted in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, something. The Bible made a prediction. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. We're doing fine. We're right on schedule. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Verse 3. Do you see verse 3? Come on. Uh-huh. Now, I want that next verse. Who? A power would arise that would want to take on godly prerogatives. Now, this is amazing to me because if you go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 and read about the, and read about the insanity that greeted the mind of Satan, that series of verses winds up saying that Satan says, I will be like the Most High God. So a power that seeks to replace God or take his spot is inspired by Satan. It's a power that wants to take on God's attributes. And Paul wrote, that power shall be revealed. Revelation 13, 5 and 6 says, that power will blaspheme God's tabernacle. Now, pray for me, saints. We have disassociated infallibility from a human being. We've also pointed out that infallibility and apology don't go together. But my subject is, I do not apologize. Go now to Malachi 3 and verse 6. <laughs> Malachi 3 and verse 6. You see it there? Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 3 and verse 6. What does it say? For I am the Lord, I therefore... I wish you could read it in the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, I am the Lord, I don't need to change.
Now, wait a minute. This sounds like infallibility. It sounds like God is saying, I'm the one who's infallible. I don't apologize. I'm the Lord. I change not. Hebrews 1.12, God is the same. Numbers 23.19, he can't lie. Psalm 19.8, his statutes are right. 33.4, his word is right. Isaiah 45.19, I declare only the things that are right. Isaiah 46.9 and 10, what I declare will occur. I am infallible. In fact, Psalm 147.5 says, his understanding is infinite. So the God that we serve is in fact truly infallible and people who are infallible don't need to apologize. In fact, in Exodus 33, 19, he says, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Romans 9 and verse 15 says, I will bless who I want to bless, I will curse who I want to curse, and I will not ask you. Now let me lead you to part four of the sermon. It's obvious no man can be infallible. It's obvious that God is infallible. But the point is, are you prepared to accept God's infallible status in your life? It's one thing to tote God for being infallible. There are many sincere Catholics who believe the Pope is. But all Christians should believe that God is infallible, can do no wrong. But if you really believe that, then your speech and your life and your faith ought to reflect that. Because if you read the Bible through and through, I don't care if he allows people to suffer for their sins, if he allows people to be killed, if he allows people to go through kinds of troubles and trials. No where in the Bible does God ever say, I apologize? He doesn't have to. The infallibility of God is the hardest doctrine for a Christian to accept. And it comes out in your talk. Why did God let me lose my husband? Why did God let me lose my child? Why did God let me get cancer? Why did God let me not get this new job, this new uh, appointment, this new raise? Why did God not allow me to get that car? Because he's infallible and his decisions don't need to be second guessed. Therefore, if he does it, it is right. But do you believe that? He's an amazing God. He says in Isaiah, if I say something, my counsel will stand. His infallibility is something you can rely upon, Gary. If his counsel stands, that also means when he says your sins are forgiven, then your sins are forgiven. Oh, come on, somebody out there. If he's infallible, that means that if your past is wiped away, then your past is wiped away. Why? If he says it, that's it. Moses worked for 120 years leading the children of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land. Forty years, then the time of testing, forty years. And then when he came out of the testing time, made God's leader 40 years, wrestling with those hard-headed people, and he made one mistake. One! Some of us have sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and one! <coughs> and Deuteronomy says to the people, I, I got to the land. I asked the Lord to let me see it. And he said, you will not go over. Because at the waters, 
You did not obey me. One sin. And if you read the text <coughs> in Deuteronomy uh, 23 through 27, you're looking, Jacob, for some, some soft touch by God. Uh, Moses, I regret deeply that, 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 that you can't go over. I, I'm just torn about it. And, 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 and I really... Uh, 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 you cannot go in. And the conversation ends all the conversation ends almost abruptly. Now I can recall sitting in the hospital, having just had the lung surgery, saying to the Lord, This makes no sense at all. None. No fat baby boy sitting there looking at me in his mother's lap. No sense at all. To bring somebody in the ministry five years, let their lungs go bad. What sense does this make? And I'm still waiting on his apology. <laughs> Rise up and preach till I say stop. Moses, you're not going in. No gentle touch. You see, it's one thing for us to sit here and say amen to this sermon. It's another to conduct your life as if you believe that God is so infallible, He cannot treat you wrong. Why me? Because He's infallible. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't apologize. Job. Job. He wiped the poor brother out. Come on, y'all. In three days. And Job complains for thirty seven chapters. And then in chapter 38, God gets tired. Verse 2. Who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without understanding? Excuse me, Job. Who is this putting me on trial with their fallible view? Who is this that questions how I take and give. And then the Lord spends the next four chapters just talking about what it's like to be God. <laughs> Where were you when I hung clouds on nothing? Where were you when I taught the ostrich to bury its egg in the sand and go back and find it when the sand is not over? Where were you when I said to the Pacific Ocean, this far, no far? And finally, by the time you get to Job 42, verse 6, Job's response is, Job's response is, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I read in the Hebrew, you know what it reads? I apologize. I'm sorry, God. I forgot who's God. I'm coming home to you. You ought to apologize for complaining about rough times. You ought to apologize for complaining when you lost this, that, and the other. You ought to apologize. Because you are the fallible one, he's the infallible one, and all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I don't need to explain to you why your marriage fell apart. I don't need to apologize to you because you now don't have the job you want. I am infallible. I look down yonder, I see how it's going to turn out, and I start here. I can't make a mistake because when I start something, I've already visited where it's going to end. There was Paul. 
He had a confounded thorn in his side. We don't know what in the world it was. Somebody said he was blind. Somebody said he was crippled. Somebody said he had kidney disease. Scholars said all kinds of things. Paul said, I talked to him about it three times. And he said, don't ask me anymore. <laughs> now, you're laughing. You may never get the doctor's degree. Single, you may never get married. Divorced, you may never get remarried. Married, you may never get out of it. Don't look to heaven for an apology. Loretta, when you were born, God chased you out. He had one go. Stay with the pastor. Just a few more minutes. One go. One go. I want to get Loretta Nelson into the kingdom. That's all I'm about. And I saw her born, and I saw her end. And I've decided that in between born and end, this is what needs to happen so that she never ends. So, so I've worked it out this way. Now, I want you to know, in Moses' case, he did not ask Moses, how do you feel about not going in? In Job's case, he didn't ask Job, would you like to be a test case of faith? Me and the devil had a discussion about, um, you know, and, 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 and Job, we need a volunteer. How do you feel? The first time Job knew was somebody came in and said, hey, hey, all your cattle are gone. And that man barely got a sentence out. Here comes another person. And then all your children are gone. The Lord that we serve looks at the Loretta Nelsons and Henry Wrights and they says, this is what's needed. Why? Because if I negotiate with them, they are so fallible and so intensely intent on their agenda. They will make suggestions that I really can't swallow because I've been where they haven't been. I see past, present, and future in one blow. So I know if this happens, that will wind up taking them from me. And God will do anything to keep the devil from taking you from him. The closest we ever get to an apology from God is in Genesis 6-6. Six, six. <laughs> Holy Ghost has got him now. Look at him grabbing them Bibles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where, where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me see that. Let me see that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it repented the Lord. That he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Only the human race has ever driven God to the edge. <laughs> Can I get a witness in this house? Only the human race has brought God to say, you know, maybe that was not one of our best ideas. Only the human race. But he falls short, Sonia, of an apology. See, the, the Hebrew says, it broke his heart. Now, he could have apologized and straightened it out. But what he decided was that rather than make an apology, he'd make a savior. I'm not 
not go say I'm sorry. I'll become sorry for them. I will not apologize for making them. I'll just remake them in me. And so I do not apologize for taking your sins on my back. I do not apologize. For becoming dirty flesh like you. I do not apologize for forgiving you and washing you clean. I do not apologize for exposing myself to death and Satan. I don't apologize. And you see, Paul Buckmeyer, this is why the devil worked so hard on Jesus on the cross. He was trying to get him to be sorry. If I can just get him, Charles, in Gethsemane to regret that he did it. Father, he's at the brink again. We always get to him now. Anybody gets to him, it's us. Father, if it be possible, this is a group here. Take this cup. Nevertheless, he knows about the infallible Father. Not my will. I'm in human flesh. We're fallible. We'll mess up. Thine be done. And God, who's already visited the other side of the cross and is already sitting in the tomb waiting to call the son out of the grave, says there's no need for us to apologize or change our mind. It's going to be all right. Hang in there, Jesus. There's no apology. And so this same Jesus who went through that experience is the same Jesus who will make this earth the headquarters of the whole universe. This same Jesus whom Satan thought he would drive and push to the point he would regret being our Savior. This same Jesus will lead us into the 12 gates of the city. And we will study war no more. This same Jesus. And I can hear him say, as he closes the gates to the city, I can hear him say, as the fire and brimstone come down and purify this earth, and rid the earth even of death and sin, I can hear a voice from glory coming down through time saying, I did it and I do not apologize. We trust that this week's message was truly a blessing. If you have any questions about the message you heard or would like to contact a pastor for Bible studies, please let us know by selecting the Contact Us link on our home page. Thank you again for joining us by listening, and remember to check back next week for another featured message.